turn now to our scripture passage for today, Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. Listen to these words of scripture. Jesus and the disciples were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We're in a season of stewardship in the life of the church right now. Uh, And throughout this season, we've had a candle before us. Just realized as this service began that I failed to light the candle. But I'm going to let that go because that's just a reminder of how vulnerable we are to losing our sense of purpose. The point I've been trying to make throughout the stewardship season this year is that stewardship is not a code word for money or anything like that, but it's about pursuit of clarity in differentiating what is a resource or a component of life and what is the purpose. And so, for example, with the idea of the candle, uh, and that's going to continue with us not just today, one more week next week, and then we'll conclude with stewardship, move on to other things. Uh, But the candle is before us to give us a, a spiritual metaphor. As we look at the candle, we learn some lessons, and then we're invited to apply those to other situations and to our own lives. And so, for example, when we come to stewardship as clarity between resources and purpose, we're reminded by the candle that the resources a candle has are pretty simple, wax and wicks. Its purpose is found not in accumulating more resources, not in making sure there's an endless supply of wax, not in having a ball of twine that can serve as an emergency wick, but its purpose is to receive the flame from another source and so hold and share light with all that are around. The purpose of a candle is light. And when we get that confused, well, we might end up with a whole lot of candles stuck in a closet somewhere and never see the light. Now, of course, there's a danger in a candle fulfilling its purpose, And in not just simply accumulating additional resources, the danger is that in fulfilling its purpose, a candle is consumed. There's less of the candle as it sheds light. But that is actually the intended way of a candle. And so we take this lesson and we apply it to other things in our life. Last week, I I talked about money a little bit and made the same point. Money is a resource for life. In the world we live in today, we hear voices that tell us the purpose of that resource is to get more of the resource. The purpose of money is to get more money. But if we remember that spiritual lesson from the candle, we arrive at the reminder that the purpose of money is not more money, 
The spiritual purpose of money is to give it away and thereby find our hearts becoming more generous. And generosity is a characteristic at the heart of God. So much that happens in Scripture that is wondrous. So much of the good news one can easily say is because of the generosity of God. And so today we turn to this passage of Scripture in which Jesus has an interaction with the disciples on the way to Jerusalem to look at one more example of stewardship's clarity between resources for life and what the purpose really is. And here Jesus is trying to make the purpose really clear, his purpose. And as Jesus talks about his purpose, because we as the church are the body of Christ, our purpose is much closer to the purpose of Jesus than we might be comfortable admitting. Now, the purpose of Jesus is something that is striking in how many times Jesus teaches this in the Gospels. It's the foreshadowing, some scholars say, but it's much more than just foreshadowing. It's the teaching about the meaning of his life and death. And of course, all the Gospels conclude with the story of the death of by crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. So it's, it's central, it's the climactic scene in Scripture. But in case we might miss that that is the climactic scene in the Gospels, Jesus teaches about his upcoming death and resurrection, not once, not twice, but three times in each Gospel on his way to Jerusalem. Now that alone should be so striking to us in terms of discovering the purpose of things and what's truly significant and important to Jesus. I mean, there are famous passages like the Beatitudes that we get a full treatment of once, one time in Matthew's Gospel, and a partial treatment of it in Luke's Gospel. Two of the Gospels don't have a version of the Beatitudes whatsoever. And yet that passage is widely regarded as being, and, and I agree, a very significant teaching of Jesus. The parable of the Good Samaritan, which is so famous, is told one time in Luke's Gospel. There are so many teachings of Jesus that are important and respected and known and loved by those who follow him, and yet they have one, maybe two tellings. The passion, the death and crucifixion of Jesus is the climactic moment of all the Gospels, and he teaches about it in addition three times in each of the four Gospels. Jesus is really trying to get us to see that this has to do with central purpose, to die and to be raised to new life. And not only is it the central purpose for Jesus, but as I said, we, the body of Christ, this purpose of Jesus is also ours. And so unfortunately, the church has preserved this centrality, but has translated into a concern that's only about the afterlife, that's only about heaven physical death at the end of our lives, and then resurrection to the afterlife, to the heavens. And I want to say to you that the heavens and the afterlife is part of what Jesus is saying, but is not the only fulfillment of this. Uh, the apostle Paul, along with Jesus, understands that Jesus' teaching about death and resurrection is not just about one time at the end of life, but this is a spiritual reality for us throughout our lives. Paul talks about the many different ways in which he experiences death in his own body, only to be raised into new life, not just someday at the end of all things, but repeatedly throughout his life, that faith and transformation and grace really does take on this stark of a reality for the life of Paul. And it's supposed to be the same for all of us. Well, it's no wonder that this sort of uncomfortable teaching gets relegated to the afterlife, or even for those original disciples, gets put on hold or basically ignored in exchange for other concerns. And so in the passage today, as soon as Jesus discloses that death and resurrection is at the center of his life and beckons the disciples to embrace and follow this way of discipleship, James and John, who don't really want to think about the loss of things, have a question. Probably a question that's been lurking in their hearts and minds for quite a while. And so they take the, <laughs> the bizarre opportunity, right after Jesus teaches about death and resurrection, to sidle up to him and say, hey, Jesus, we want you to do something for us. Jesus asked them, and what exactly is it that you want me to do for you boys? And they tell him, hey, Jesus, grant that one of us gets to sit on your right and one on your left. Hey, Jesus, give us the good seats. We know that we're two thirds of that inner circle that you've got me and my brother and Peter, and we know that you don't want to give one of those seats to Peter because Peter shoots off his mouth and you don't want to spend all of eternity and glory next to Peter. So you can put him somewhere else. It's us. Jesus, we're your guys. 
Now, uh, agreed, you nicknamed us Sons of Thunder because we've got anger management issues, and one time we asked you to condemn an entire village and rain brimstone down on it because they didn't treat us very nice, but we've grown since then. We've learned a lot. We're better people for it. Jesus, we're your guys. Give us the good seats. And Jesus, who knows full well the cross that's coming, and who it will be to his right and to his left when he enters into his kingdom through the cross, knows that James and John don't know what they're asking. If they did, they would say, forget it. We don't want those seats. We don't want to be the ones who are occupying the cross on your right and on your left. Better it be those bandits and thieves who end up in that place, Jesus. No, no. We're interested in the seats in glory. They even say that. They're very clear with Jesus what they want. And so Jesus says, you know, guys, you don't know what you're asking for, but it's exactly what you're going to receive anyway. You'll drink the cup that I drink. You'll be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And friends, that's not about water baptism. That's a symbol for death. All these things will come to you as you follow me. But the good seats, my life isn't about those things at all. That's not even mine to give out. That's how irrelevant the good seats are to what Jesus is doing. Well, the other disciples hear this and they get mad, but there's no indication they get mad because they think that James and John are in the wrong here. They probably get angry because all of a sudden they're thinking, wait a minute, we should have gotten there first. Uh, is this just about asking for what we want from Jesus? Why didn't we get there? Andrew, you were the first one to follow him. You brought other people. How come you didn't get on the ball and go and ask Jesus that question and bring one of us along? A Bartholomew, nobody knows who you are, so you shouldn't even ask. You'll never get the good seat. And Thomas is over in the corner saying, well, I doubt that I'll get it, doubting Thomas again. And, and suddenly the disciples degenerate into almost a brawl over who among them is the best. The best at missing the point. And so Jesus takes them aside and reminds them of the path and the way of Jesus. That greatness is not a category unless it's greatness in service. And I'm sure when Jesus emphasizes service, what he has in mind for us is, on the one hand, a reversal of our normal expectations, our normal interests. But that service is also a way in our own lives that we let our own egos, our own pretensions, our own grappling after greatness come to death in the fire of loving service to others. And when we serve somebody else, we are noticing the greatness that is in them. And we are making them greater by becoming a servant to that person. And so greatness and the image of God and, and new life and resurrection come to vitality and come to life in all sorts of ways. And the things that need to die get a little bit of that death and that movement out of the way when we follow Jesus with hearts that serve. Now, as we've moved through this pandemic season and things started to reopen, I have to say that there were church members who came to me and, and they said, uh, uh, you know, Pastor John, we're, you know, we're unhappy about all the things that had to stop during the pandemic. and We haven't had a good chance to serve. So tell you what, Pastor, we want you to do something for us. Give us more opportunities to serve. You give us what we want. An opportunity to demonstrate the greatness of our service. Friends, who does that sound more like from the passage? It doesn't really sound like what Jesus said when he emphasizes service. It sounds a little more like James and John. And that's the danger in those first disciples and for us, that even the category of service comes back around and becomes more about our ego. More about those deathly things that we give too much life to in us. And the way of Jesus is very different. My response is sort of like, well, uh, it was not like I wanted the pandemic. It's not like I wanted any of those ministries to shut down. But again, I think the problem is that we're missing the point. 
Is service really about a good seat or an opportunity or our own greatness or demonstrating what's good about us? Isn't service in the mouth of Jesus more than that? Not about being given some opportunity or somebody else doing something that we want, but about a stance in which we navigate life. Service is to come anywhere that we're going and adopt a servant's heart. There's nothing that prevents us from carrying ourselves as a servant as we go through life after the way of Jesus. It's really a decision that we make in a particular way that we view the world and others. We don't need somebody to do something for us so that we can be that. We need to decide after the teaching of Jesus that we are going to live and follow him in that way all the way and make opportunities to serve so that we might pass through the death of some things we don't need into life. You know, friends, it, as I think about the disciples and I think about the way a lot of us get hung up in doing church today, through these last weeks, we've talked about the way that less of one thing provides more of something else in our lives so that less wax and less wicks provides more light for the life of a candle. Last week we talked about the way that less money results in more generosity for us. And I wonder today if what we really need is less church. In the way the disciples are envisioning the church, as a grappling after, what can you do for me? And what do I want? And give me the good seat. I mean, really, that's what the disciples are doing. They're painting a picture of church according to those rules. We need less of that. We don't need any of that at all. What we need more of is the opportunity to follow Jesus. What we need more of is an opportunity to set down all those ego-driven things we do out in the world and even in the life of faith and in our spiritual journeys in exchange for more of what is truly at the center of Jesus. Uh, you see, friends, we've been talking in this season about stewardship as clarity between what are resources and what is the purpose. And today we arrive at what for me as a pastor is a pretty uncomfortable statement uh, of saying that church is not the purpose, it's a resource. And so we shouldn't be sitting around having conversations along the lines of, how do we grow the church? Because the church is the resource. The purpose is death of old ways and born into new life and resurrected life in Jesus. And there's things we do as church that help with that. And there's things we do as church that distract from that. And there are ways to turn the church into a survival mentality, especially as we claw our way through this pandemic season. And friends, that's the mistake of those original disciples. And a mistake we, wait, we make again today until we get that clarity from Jesus and remember what it's all about. Friends, I want to conclude with a story. It's the story of a mighty oak tree in a forest. And the oak tree does what oak trees are supposed to do. And and rains down upon the ground below a host of little acorns. Its purpose is life. And those acorns assemble at the base of that tree, and, and these aren't your ordinary average acorns. I mean, these are acorns that are ambitious and, and, and good leader types, and, and they tend towards activity and doing things. And so those acorns don't just sit there waiting for whatever it is that's going to come for them. No, they get together and they start doing things and making things happen. And so they form self-help groups, and they want to be the best acorns that they can be. They want to maximize what it means to be an acorn sitting in this great place amongst the roots of the great old oak tree and amongst the soft grasses that accumulate there. And so one's a good author and writes some books to help people do that, and another one's a good speaker, and so that acorn preaches lots of good messages. And all those acorns get busy trying to maximize their potential as acorns. And then one day, a real nut 
falls down from the sky. Another acorn, but not like the rest. And this acorn looks up to the sky and points the other acorns towards the majestic oak towering over them. And they say, oh yeah, we know about that. It gives us good shade. There's lots of protection there. It's really beautiful and majestic. We're in awe of it. And that nut of an acorn says to them, no friends, there's more to it than that. We are that. We, we are that? How is that? That can't be true. That's not possible. We are nothing like that. We know it. We respect it. We all but worship it. But we're also busy doing all the things we have to do because we're just acorns. No. We are that. But to become that, you must be broken open. You cannot help yourself into becoming that. You must be broken open. You must die. You can't continue to be an acorn at all anymore. But majestic and wondrous life is already a seed within you. And it can and will be brought to glorious majesty if you will die and embrace this resurrected life. But oh, how hard it is for acorns to believe. And how hard it is for all of us to embrace a loss of things we hold dear, even if they're just resources for what is yet to come. But here we are in the season under the teaching of Jesus, who reminds us of the purpose and bids us to let go of things, even great things, so that life in new and wondrous ways can emerge. May it be so for you and me, friends. In Jesus' name, let us pray. And so, O oh God, we place ourselves in your care and keeping, for you have cared and kept us. And you have given us such life and you have given us more life than we can imagine. You seed us with eternity. You give us your Son. You place your Spirit within us. You call us children. You invite us into your family. You invite us to find our place as heirs along the side of your Son. But none of this is obtained by our simply going to you and saying, Hey, God, here's what we want you to do for us. We don't even know how to let your eternal life unfold out of us. We can't do any of it without you. So God, the question for those who follow your son is not, Here's what I want you to do for me, God, but God, what should we do? What would you have us do? Teach us and guide us, God. You speak and we will listen. You crack us open and take away the things we do not need. And we trust the life that is there to come. Oh God, we are the body of Christ, the church, but we get so hung up in the resource Church is a resource to help us surrender to you so that more can unfold. And all of this brings you glory and all of this beckons this broken world to life. And all of it is full of such hope and grace for us if we would but believe and follow. God, you gave us the servant heart of Jesus. Plant that same heart within us. Oh God, help us. 
Remind us even in our prayer of this wonderful opportunity we have to put others first and to think of others. Oh God, what a wondrous thing for disciples of Jesus Christ, not to come to you and say, here's what I want you to do for me, oh God, but instead to say, oh God, won't you give this other person the seat of glory? Won't, won't you give healing and wholeness and help in these other places? Oh God, I, I forget myself and I lift them up to you. What would it have been like, Jesus, if James and John had come to you and said, you know, Peter wouldn't even be here without Andrew. Maybe he should have the seat. Thaddeus is never going to be as famous as us, so maybe he ought to have that seat, Jesus. It's not what our life is about anyway. We don't need it. Why should we want it? So here's our opportunity, God, in prayer and in faithfulness and worship to have a different interest, a different purpose, and to seek a better answer and ask better questions of you. So here are our prayers, our hearts, our questions. Forgive us when we get distracted and get wrapped up in the wrong things and go our own way. For you are God, high and lifted up and majestic and wondrous and loving to give us something of eternal life now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.